Hello and good morning to you. It, uh, it's actually about 9 o'clock on uh, January 30th. It's going to be video 7 to 8. And um, I'm going to make this video in the hope that my daughter will interrupt it so we can go get some bagels. Um, tempting fate a little bit here, but well, it's true. It's kind of a joke. It's not very funny. It's too early for humor, I think. But um, yesterday was just a terrible day, and um, for me, and maybe that's part of life. Occasionally, we do have those terrible days, just terrible days. And um, you know, my work was my work was off. My my day was just off. It was just a bad day. I was behind in my workload and so I was already, you know, frustrated and stressed out. Um, on my break, I went and I saw um, some snippets of some trans stuff that had happened during the week. And, um, you know, one of them was about <clears throat> Laverne Cox. And, um, they were interviewing her for her boyfriend. She was talking about her boyfriend. And she kind of made a statement about how, you know, guys who date trans women um, kind of live in this trap of thinking that they might be gay or other people may think that they're gay because they're dating uh, a trans woman. And it really kind of dove another uh, kind of arrow deep into my heart because I hope, you know, I hope one day to, to meet somebody, you know. And it was like, you know, okay, here's another social convention that is totally wrong, <laughs> but it's against me, you know, and I was like, it was against me. It was an obstruction. It was an obstacle to be overcome, you know, that, you know, and maybe why there's only 16 people out of a thousand who would be interested in dating a trans woman, you know, maybe because of that stigma, you know, for years and years and years and years, you know, we've had this book, not this book. It'd be nice to have the book that's been to tormenting us and I'd lock it away. I'd probably burn it. But, you know, this book, the, the Bible, it's my Bible. Keep it by my bedside because I do read from it. Uh, but, you know, for years and years and years, We've been persecuted by people taking that book out of context and using snippets of it for their own political, sociological, ideological advantage. And just how just wrong that is, you know. But there's enough people to follow it that it gives people who know how to manipulate them power. And that's where you see these churches. Unfortunately, they're churches or they're cults. You can think of one mega church, Joel Olstein. It's almost like a cult, you know, who have these power. And they're not taxed. So then they have this money. And they have influence on politicians. And if you have a politician, again, who knows they can use this rhetoric to amass power and plug into emotions and manipulate people to get their votes or to get their money. I mean, it's the making of a really like a film or something about a villain, you know, maybe the next James Bond villain. Uh, you know, won't be a weapons manufacturer, 
it's been so long since I've seen a James Bond movie, I'll be honest with you, but you know, the next James Bond villain might be the leader of a cult. You know, I, I don't know, but they have power and influence. And I think what happened yesterday was just the conditions were right to just knock me over. And, um, there's a politician in Congress right now. She just got elected from Georgia. And I won't, I don't even get going to give her the, the, the credit to say her name. Um, but she's a QAnon follower. And um, she's just a real nasty person, as near as I can tell. She uh, refuses to accept the legitimacy of her Muslim uh and non-Christian uh, Congress folk because they didn't swear their allegiance on a Bible. She uh, she accosted a survivor of the Parkland shooting and tried to verbally degrade them, saying that the shooting was a hoax. And I mean, just, just somebody, again, of a certain ideology and a certain firebrand charisma that just attracts followers. You know, we see people throughout history who just attract people who either want to be, you know, in uh, the Devo song, Freedom of Choice, talks about, you know, everybody wants freedom of choice, but in the reality, they want freedom from choice, you know, um, and, and they're willing to give that up for the idea of some sort of safety, security, or stability. And so I had to think about, you know, as, as crazy as this woman is that got elected and she refused to go, go through the metal detector at Congress because she's packing a handgun and she won't give up her handgun. And she, like I said, she, she tormented this kid who saw his friends get shot at a school shooting, telling him it was fake. I mean, just not a nice person to begin with but she must have had enough people behind her to get her elected. You know what I mean? And much like we saw in the Trump election, this cult of personality, this, again, this caricature of what I would say scum and villainy in a person, they attract followers and they, like you said, they gain power and influence and they get elected. So, I mean, again, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a bad apple. It's not a fluke. It's just, it happens. And if we go back to the Trump election or the second election, what we just went through, um, you know, here you have a, a, a person, a man, uh, who said he likes to grab women by their vagina or their pussy. Okay. Um, He's had multiple affairs, sex with women, you know, done a lot of things that you would think out of this book would, you know, Christians would be like, oh my gosh, you know, he's the Antichrist or he's Satan. He's a spawn of Satan. But no, they embraced him, you know, and uh, on a whim for a public picture, he uh, he ordered his, his thugs, his guard, to uh to gas you know use tear gas and explosives and non less lethal ammunition which doesn't mean it's not lethal it's less lethal against people who were pre peacefully protesting so he could walk across and get his picture taken and he had a bible that he held upside down i don't think he ever read it um you know just just obviously to me at least, you know, not a good guy, but they embraced him and they loved him. And you can see the pictures of them holding their Bibles and their, their Christian flags and everything and embracing him. Like I said, there's just something about that. Mm, you know, it appeals to them. And um, not to, I don't want to focus too much on politics, but you know, that belief system of the leader is right and everyone else is wrong. It's a cult. It's definitely fascist, you know, 
only the leader is right. We don't question the leader. Um, but enough people voted, you know, when Donald Trump ran, um, you know, it wasn't a, um, you know, if, uh, the opponent, Joe Biden, had got like an over overwhelming majority, and I'm talking like 30 70 split, then it would be like, okay, this is a national renunciation of this hypocrisy and fascism and white supremacy and everything. And you would be like, my gosh, um, you know. The, the people, the good people came out and, and, ma and made their stand against the bad people, the bad ideology. But that's not what happened. It wasn't a 70-30 split. You know, it was a 46. <laughs> I mean, um, close enough that I imagine if a lot of people had voted independent, we would be looking at a Al Gore, President Bush, you know, so close you really can't call it, you know. So, you know, it, all of this just kind of built up upon me, built up upon me, built up upon me. And, um, you know, the world, pain and suffering just kind of, it just knocked me a little bit over the edge. But then I saw we were talking about this Laverne Cox interview. And there's this attitude that, you know, being transgender is okay if you're pretty, if you're handsome, you know? And it, it just, you know, Laverne Cox is a very beautiful woman inside and out. She's got a good personality. She's got a good moral compass. She's beautiful physically, beautiful spiritually. But, you know, the general populace probably wouldn't even know she's trans. I mean, she's pretty tall. And I can think of another friend of mine who's just absolutely beautiful. And if you saw them without reference to their size, you'd be like, oh my gosh, she's a beautiful young lady. Um, unfortunately, she has the same height that I do. So it's like when you see her framed against something and you get a sense of scale you're like holy fuck she's tall you know which again you know okay that's what am i saying there you know well what i'm saying is it's it's that social reaction of something's out of place and the talking heads and whatnot are like you know oh it's you know trans women are are you know i i don't mind trans women as long as they're pretty and that really pushed me over the edge yesterday. You know, someone said, oh, I didn't know she was trans. She was, she saw, she's so pretty. She's such a beautiful woman. What does that mean? What that person is saying is only ugly women are trans women. President Biden uh, nominated uh, the first trans woman that we know of. Because if they're pretty, you know, they go unnoticed. They're stealth, right? Um, to head his, uh, and I'm going to say health cabinet. I don't think that's it, though. They're, they're totally qualified. They're a doctor. They're a medical doctor. So, yeah. Um, totally qualified. Years and years of experience. It's, you know, it's not just a photo op. And the first thing I heard from somebody was, well, gee, I wish he just would have nominated someone that was pretty. I mean, we don't, we don't say that about guys, you know, President Biden nominates Joe, Joe Frank for secretary of treasury and education. And, you know, the person doesn't turn to the other person and say, gee, I just wish he would have, you know, nominated someone that was handsome, you know, and that, that mechanism, that thought is just something that's just another obstacle 
it's another thing, to, another challenge that we have, another thing to be overcome. And I can think about, you know, off the top of my head, five friends of mine who are in their 20s, um, transitioned in their 20s of uh, the, the body build, body frame that, you know, as the fat is redistributed and the muscle is redistributed, they're going to not look out of place. Okay, they're going to be like Laverne Cox. They're going to be beautiful and pretty. And, you know, that's great for them. But that statement about pretty and women and, you know, it's acceptable because they're pretty. That's very degrading towards women in general. You know, the, the bulk of the population is not model standard, you know, what society for the last 200 years, 100 years has perpetuated as being the ideal female form. You know, which is why there's such a, a high industry for beauty products. And, you know, if you, you know, if you, uh, if you use oil of olays, you know, or, or a roch, a wrinkle cream, you know, you're going to look 20 years younger. And then they show some woman who doesn't need it. And it's like, oh, without my roch, I don't know what I would do, you know. You look at all the cover girl commercials, they're all girls in their teens who don't need to be wearing makeup, you know, because they want to project this image that that's what you're going to be. That's what we value. You know? So again, back to that statement of, about she was so pretty, I didn't know she was a trans woman. You know, do you treat pretty woman differently than you do non pretty woman? It isn't pretty uh, open to interpretation based on the individual. I mean, I know we have we have norms that we kind of think of as being you know certain body types, certain body shapes. And if you go back into uh, history and you look at paintings of women uh, throughout different periods of history, you, you can see what was idolized as being ideal varied from age to age. You know, there there are women my size. Uh, and shape, <laughs> you know, lounging around, uh, drinking, you know, eating olives and sucking on, you know, wine. And it's like, oh, she's beautiful. I'm going to play a DD and d game today. I'm going to run that features a very obese <laughs> and overweight woman, uh, you know, and, and she's surrounded by these people. Like, she's so beautiful. Oh, if only she was my wife, you know. And then there are other phases of history where it's, it's flipped. You have the women in the corsets and the waists, you know, the empire waists that are so tight and, you know, oh, that's beauty, you know, so it's very subjective to the age, but also to the person. But as someone who has fought with fighting my own sense of lack of those qualities and will I be a woman? Will I? Will I make it, you know, my own uh, problems and lack of my problems, my problems. Be seeing that yesterday was just a total slap in the face. I was already on the edge of madness and sadness and self-defeat. It just pushed me over, you know, and I was just like, oh, God, here we go. You know, so that happened. And then... Um, Another article that I read yesterday was about a army chaplain who uh, this last week wrote an article for the Military Times about how trans folk were unfit for duty because they were mentally incompetent. And his reasoning for being mentally incompetent and he also said they were an affront to God, which again, I can't, we just can't get away from this damn book. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a Jesus follower or, or, you know, if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, okay, go back and reread all the gospels. Jesus said nothing, not a word about being gay, 
being straight, you know, transgender. Jesus said nothing. Go do a word search. Read every word if you, if you must from the Bibles. Jesus said nothing about being gay, being straight. He didn't criticize people for being gay, being straight. He didn't say they were a sin. They didn't say they were against God. They didn't say they were against what he believed. Okay. Other people have said that. Paul. Paul wrote about lots of things. Poor Paul. Paul spent a lot of time in jail writing letters. But, you know, Paul had to deal with trying to set up, prop up the early church and Paul had a lot of conditions he was trying to, you know, he was trying to address. And people would say, well, the Jesus says this, the church says this. And Paul's like mitigating it and saying, well, in this situation, you should do this. But in that situation, you should do. So Paul's trying to like set up the dogma of the religion. You know, Jesus kind of in a way had it easy. Whatever Jesus said is what Jesus said, right? You know, here Paul and the other apostles, they had to, if they lived, uh, they weren't tortured or put to death. You know, they, they had to kind of write the dogma of the, you know, of what would become later Christianity or what other people manipulated in their own way to become Christianity. I forgot how we got down that rabbit hole, but, oh, the chaplain. So the chaplain used an analogy. Analogy. Hi, my son. Hello. How are you? You can go up there. Oh, he wants to be held. Isn't that nice? Um, but he uses the uh, oh the chaplain. I'm sorry, we were talking about the chaplain. Um. Mm, yes. Um. But he said they were unfit for duty because they were like the flat earthers who just couldn't accept reality. And that reality was biology. And biology dictated their sex, therefore their gender, blah, 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 blah. And so they were mentally unfit for duty. And he, he, he ended it by saying, what a waste of resources. You know, and uh, like I said, he was a chaplain in the army. And I was kind of taken back because, you know, to be in the army, the army exists really for very few purposes. And among them is, is to kill people and break things. Um, not to say that's all they do, but I mean, that's what you, you need an army to defend and an army to attack, you know, and, and blow shit up, you know, blow up bridges, blow up tanks, blow, I mean, you know. But again, here for him to say they're like the flat earthers, they're denying reality. You know, I would almost say the reverse was happening. Here you had a, a man who, for whatever his own reasons, decided it was time to criticize and deny reality that, you know, trans folk and non-binary folk are, are no longer hiding they're out in the open and you know it really kind of made me sad that you know here you know during president biden's first week you know he reversed a lot of the harmful things that president trump did against transgender folk that passed because nobody cared about the transgender folk you know nobody cared they let it happen, you know. The justices in the in the courts they didn't have any problem with uh, taking away transgender people's rights. You know, they didn't have a problem taking away their health care. You know, their workplace protections or you know everything. They didn't have a problem with it. And uh, you know, Trump. People that voted for Trump probably didn't know. But, you know, they didn't have a problem with it. They didn't have a problem with him grabbing women by their, their private parts. They didn't have a problem with uh, 
him taking away, separating children from their parents. You know, again, it's like there's this accountability that people, uh, you know, I don't know, just like I said, it pushed me over the edge yesterday. But again, this chaplain and then, you know, saying, oh, they're not accepting reality. And, you know, I, I guess it, it made me just so frustrated. And it made me, it made me angry. And the, the, the suicide flags went up. The white flags went up. Okay, because I was having thoughts of killing myself. You know, if, if I'm not accepting reality and, uh, you know, I'm not going to, um, you know, not going to get married, da, 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 da. then, you know, why live? You know, no one's ever going to love me. Da, da, da. Of course, I got my, my little friend here. He loves me. But, you know, just the whole, the whole kit and caboodle just made me so sad. It made me so frustrated and I just wanted to give up. And so circling back to the start of this, you know, we have those days. And, you know, hopefully in your own journey, in your own experience, and it's not necessarily a trans thing, there are going to be things in this life that are going to knock you down. And, you know, in the moment we may say or do things that we may not necessarily regret, but we may have a different outlook on at a later date, date and time. You can't see him. He's so damn cute. Can you see him? <laughs> Did you know that I needed some loving? He's like, yeah, yeah, shut up, pet me. Hi. Um, but, you know, let me let him get here. You, you go explore. Thank you. Um, you know, again, there's such a, we've made a lot of accomplishments, but we got a long way to go. You got a long way to go. You know, who's to say that the next election cycle you know, three, three and a half years from now when people are campaigning again, you know, if you have people like this woman in Congress who, or President Trump or someone like him comes back and someone says, hey, it worked for Trump, I'm going to try it. You know, they can take away those rights. They can take away those things. You know, as, as something is given, it can be taken away. You know, if Trump was able to take away it and Joe was able to re restore it, then someone else can take it away again. You know, my hope is that our society continues to evolve. And I think about my daughter in there. And I think about the majority of my friends who are younger than I am, who their friends who are just, you know, they're, they're not, they're not old enough to buy into this shit not this shit not the bible but you know the hate and they vote they're in power you know it's almost like you have these islands of old thinking for lack of a better word white supremacy and i think about my own grandparents who would talk about the colored you know, my, my grandfather, there's a picture of him right back there, he was in the Navy. See him? Um, if I had my hair back, you'd see, you'd see what he'd look like if he was fat. Um, you know, to his dying day, you know, before the Alzheimer's kick set in, he'd talk about, you know, I wonder what those colors are doing over there. Okay. Those islands of ideas, whether it be what I would call white supremacy or systemic racism or, you know, this hatred of the other, the unknown, the other, whether it be homosexuality or transgender or non-binaryism or whatnot, it's just going to take time for those islands to depopulate 
only, you know, if, if nothing else, through national na natural attrition. Like my grandfather passed away. When he passed away, he took those ideas with him. He was one less person who believed in those. And like I said, I, I think um, so long as that continues to happen, you know, you're going to, those ideas, there's going to be less and less of those ideas. Now that said, hatred is a very powerful motivator and definitely in terms of white supremacy. And so if you're again a political candidate and you want to attract followers and influence power and money, you might cater to those islands. And so, you know, here you had Trump when um, the uh, white supremacists came out of the forest with the tiki torches and chanting about killing Jews and black people. At the, at the black church in Charlotte. You know, Trump said, oh, they're good people. They're good people on both sides. Okay. So, like I said, I, I think, again, as that power diminishes and becomes further and further, you know, they talk about alt-right, or um, I can't think of the word for it, a minority, but a powerful minority. You know, they're going to lose that influence, you know. They're obviously, but, but again, I have to remind you, in the last election, 70 million, 70 plus million people voted for Trump. You know, they were okay with white supremacy. They were okay with saying black lives don't matter. They were okay with his, you know, anti-trans, anti-gay policies. Okay. And that's what scares me. Yeah, that's what scares me to be so blinded. If you get this thing on your side, there are people who are so blinded because people have realized they can use this to manipulate other people to do their bidding because they say, oh, it's the word of God. And if you don't do what I tell you to do, therefore you're against God and you're going to go to hell and burn. Whereas if you do what I say you should do, which is the word of God, then heaven, you will, you will die and you will go to paradise and you'll sit at the, you know, sit with Jesus and, you know, suck lemonade and whatever. Whip slaves all day. Uh, sorry, that's a very low blow there. But it's true. Sure. Um, the other article that I read yesterday that really kind of broke my heart. I think it was in Ohio, but it might be in Montana. I'm sorry, I don't know the state. I've already forgotten. But there was a eight year old girl who was at school, and she really liked this other girl. She's a good friend, whatnot. And she was, I don't know if, you, if you're a parent or not, but if you're a parent, you know that children are trying to process emotions and what to do with them and what if they're learning all the time. And this little eight-year-old girl told another eight-year-old girl that she, she had a crush on her. She liked her. Well, the staff at the school found out about it told the principal about it and the principal immediately expelled the eight-year-old girl for being homosexual and then later expelled her brother because the family had violated the school code because the school was a Christian school and the mother was just flabbergasted and Apparently, when she picked up her daughter, um, the principal said, you know, your daughter said she liked another girl. And the parent was like, and, you know, she could, you know, he said, well, she had a crush on her. And she was like, and, like I said, that's that youth that are out there now, you know, but here you have those islands of hatred, you know, the principal. You know, and, um, you know, that really pushed me over the edge, too. 
Because in my Bible, I don't know about your Bible, you know, my Bible is uh, for Catholics, so maybe you could say that it's, you know, Robin's is a Catholic and her Bible is not my Bible. I don't know. But in my Bible, Jesus said, love one another. And that just totally pissed me off yesterday. It pushed me over the edge. Again, just the idea of the hatred. Now, I taught. I taught middle school for a couple of years. And if I had a problem with a child, I would ask for a parent-teacher conference. And, you know, I wouldn't expel the student like she was garbage. And here, this little eight-year-old girl, you know, like I said, they may have been painting or playing on the playground, and she just likes to be with this other girl, you know. And here, this girl, it might be traumatized for the rest of her life, you know. And she's already down the path of thinking what's acceptable and unacceptable, you know. Oop. Why is it? Oh, is it recording still? <laughs> Sorry, I guess I better shut up. Right, the uh, the computer lost power. I didn't realize I didn't plug in the computer all the way. Anyway, I will shut up. I'll take that as a sign. Yes, God. Um, goddess. That's the other thing. There's this really good book. This book was written by a uh, Catholic nun. Boy, it was Catholics. Always fucking with shit, right? But it's uh, She Who Is. And Elizabeth A. Johnson. But if you want to get a, a different perspective on the Bible, this is written by a nun. And, uh, man, open your eyes, open your eyes totally just on how fucked up this book is. <laughs> and she uses citations. You can go check her references out just so she, you know, she's not full of shit, but, but yeah, this whole notion of God being a woman, you know, she who is. Hmm. Those islands of hate? No, no, no. Men are men are superior. Men, God, Adam, Jesus, men. Men are better than women. Wasn't always the case. Was not always the case historically. Like I said, Jesus, uh, Jesus is way cool. King Missile. Uh. <laughs> Like I said, when you read about what Jesus said about men and women, and then you read this pile of shit, this thing here, you're like, whoa, boy, they really screwed over women. And yet, countless thousands of men and women every day. Oh, I'm going to go to Bible study and learn how to oppress women. But anyway, I, I'm going out of topic. I'm going out of this lane, going out of this lane. So anyway, um, yesterday really just it just sucked it just pushed me over and i was i was just ready i was ready for the man and men in black to come and just put me out of my misery um i joked about when i was in school that there's a piece of skylab there's a piece of skylab up there with my name on it if you're not familiar with skylab it was uh nasa's really really their first manned space station, although it really was like the size of two school buses put together. But they conducted experiments, and there was three Skylabs, I believe, about 1975. And um, uh, in their wisdom, NASA just let them burn up in the atmosphere and, and rain debris around the world. But I always joked about that there's a piece of Skylab up there, one of the Skylabs, my name on it. And someday, when it is my time to go, uh, God will just 
aim and snap that little piece down on me and just, just kill me instantly. And that doesn't mean I want to die. It's just I, I acknowledge that one day I will no longer be on this planet. So I was ready for, I was ready. I was ready yesterday. I've, I've made my peace. Again, I'm not suicidal. I'm not going to kill myself. But I was ready. I was resolved. I was like, you know what? Like, Calgon, take me away. Just if it's my time, take me. And I'm happy to say today is, is a much, much better day. So, all right, I've gone on way too long once again. If you've uh, watched this video on the treadmill, congratulations. You are awesome on the tree. You're awesome. Anyway, I mean, you subscribe, you, you watch this channel. You are awesome. <laughs> but I will sign off here. And um, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. Till next time. Best of luck to you in your journey. I used to say best of luck in becoming your authentic self as you define it. And that really has kind of rung true, especially in the resurgence of, uh, or the uh, assurgence, is there such a thing, of non-binary people. I know more nine, I'm, I'm beginning to know more non-binary than trans people. Uh, and I almost wonder, I had heard something about, you know, the difference between a cross-dresser and a trans woman is five months. Um, and, uh, I almost wonder if being non-binary is a precursor to transitioning, being transgender, but now I think, uh, I think it's the reverse. I think it's, I don't think it's the reverse. I think it's, it's, uh, if we had a, a van, is it a Van de Graaff? No, that's the thing that makes your hair grows up. A Venn diagram intersecting circles um i think that um non-binary is this wonderful sandbox where you don't have to commit to anything you just get to live and explore and see what strikes you and what like you know i definitely have my foot firmly in the transgender camp but in many ways, I think I, I also too am very non-binary. Obviously, I, you know, I'm, I, and this is going to go against stereotypes. But you know, I'm a, I'm a gamer, video games. Uh, I'm an RC pilot. Um, I don't necessarily think I do stereotypical male stuff. But I, again, I think much like those islands of hate, I think those things are going to go away too. You know, we got, we got girl Eagle Scouts now. That was something else that happened in the last week. Um, the first girl Eagle Scout got her badge. All the power to her. And, um, you know, I, I think back to those, the counterculture of the 1960s. Really, we owe them a lot. And I'm not necessarily talking about Stonewall. But the Stonewall riots, obviously, for gay people and then trans, and we're all like in this boat. But the nonconformance of the 1960s, we owe them a lot because they took the fabric of society and norm normalcy and just began to pull it apart and expand it like a, a roll of hot taffy. And pull it apart and pull it apart and pull it apart and bend it and, you know, uh, it became very avant-garde, some of the things that they did. And again, I, I think that non-binary is just pulling, it's pulling what we would say the gender spectrum. It's pulling it in another direction and saying, no, you don't have to commit to that. You don't have to commit to that. You can be yourself and not fuck everybody else, but but have that freedom. And if you decide when you want to, if you decide that you want to take that another step and be transgender, you can. I mean, isn't it? I mean, as 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 terrible as the situation is, the oppression, both from this book and society, somewhat is those islands of hate. 
um, isn't it wonderful that we we're allowing that to happen you know and my daughter <laughs> God bless her. We were talking about Culture Club the other day, and for the longest time, I thought Boy Jules was a girl. You know, Here, catch me in my own shit, right? You know, he's too pretty to be a boy. <laughs> you know, but again, if we didn't have Culture Club in the eighties. We didn't have Boy George being pretty. Hmm. Makes you wonder where we'd be today. Remember Adam Ant? Goody two shoes. He wore makeup, remember? And oh my gosh, people go crazy. Nowadays you have Harry Styles. You know, you have this uh, young man wearing granny dresses. I mean, just, I guess we just embrace it and celebrate it. All right, enough of my bullshit. Good luck to you. Good luck for anything. Till next time. Bye-bye.